Hello and good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Josie and I'm part of the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK and I'm delighted to welcome you to the second event in our Lab Notes online series for 2022. So today we are joined by um, Benedict Holbling from the University College London and Professor James Rowe from the University of Cambridge. They'll be sharing their research into frontotemporal dementia. Um, but just before we get started, I'll go over a bit of housekeeping. So during the event today, you're welcome to switch on the automatic subtitles using the CC button that you can see at the bottom of your screen. They're not 100% accurate during the live event, but they will be edited, so they are correct on the event recording. If you've missed any of our previous Lab Notes events, you can watch them back in your own time as they are all available on the Lab Notes webpage or over on our YouTube channel. During this event today, if you would like to ask a question, you will need to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your answer. Please do submit questions throughout the event and we will answer as many as we can in the Q&A session after the talks. Um, so now we're going to ask you a few poll questions because while we can't see you due to the online format of this event, we're really keen to know a little bit more about you. So. These questions just ask about your reasons for attending today, to rate your current knowledge of dementia research and whether you've attended one of our lab notes sessions before. So the first question is, how would you rate your knowledge of dementia research? Next is, which of these best describes your reasons for attending? So do you have dementia? Does a friend or family member have dementia? Are you a carer? Perhaps your work is related to someone with dementia? or perhaps you don't have a personal connection, but you're just really interested to find out more about research. And then finally, is your, this your first dementia research event? So is this your first Lab Notes event that you've attended from us? So I'll just wait a couple more seconds while those answers come in. And there we go. So you should be able to see those results on your screen now. So it looks like most people have said they've got an average knowledge of dementia research, which is great. We really hope these events are um, catered for people who have maybe little or no knowledge. So we're really pleased um, to have you here today. Um, lots of people who have a friend or a family with, member with dementia, a few people who work in dementia, and then or oh, a pretty even split of people who have been before and haven't been before. So um, as we do have a few new people joining us today, uh, I thought I'd give a really brief introduction to who we are here at Alzheimer's Research UK and what we do um, as the charity. So I've got a few slides to share with you. Um, now, just get the right thing up. There we go. So hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so here at Alzheimer's Research UK, we are the UK's leading dementia research charity. So our mission um, is we're dedicated to diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and finding a cure for dementia. So we are backed by our really passionate scientists and our really um, passionate supporters uh, to fund and deliver pioneering research. So we work to challenge the way people think about dementia and bring together the people and organizations who can help speed up the progress. We really believe that medical research can and will deliver life-changing preventions, treatments, and one day a cure for dementia. So we do our work in a number of ways. Um, firstly, one of those things we do um, and that you'll hear a lot more about today is we fund pioneering research. So um, we've got Benedict and James speaking to us today about the research that they do. And with our network centres across the country, we also help to support our researchers um, and increasing the number of researchers in the dementia field, as well as, well as helping to power some, uh, their collaboration as well. You can find out more about all of our research that we fund on our website. As well as funding our important and vital research, we also work to build an understanding of dementia. So you might have seen some of our recent brand campaigns over the past couple of years, or um, you might have had a question about dementia that you needed to that you wanted to find out an answer to. So our information services team work really, really hard to make sure all of our information on dementia is on our website is up to date. And they also look after our dementia research info line. So this is a service that we provide where you can call or email the team with any questions that you might have about research. 
Um, they also produce health information booklets all about dementia, which you can also order for free as well. And finally, as a charity, we also aim to make sure that dementia research is a national priority by working to influence national and international policy, uh, improving the dementia research environment, as well as ensuring that Alzheimer's Research UK's work is recognised. We work with government, charities and other international organisations across a range of issues, from research funding to accessing new treatments. And all of this information is also on our website as well. So without further ado, let's move on to the focus of today's event. So our speakers today will be talking about frontotemporal dementia, or this is sometimes known as FTD. So we'll be hearing from Benedict first, followed by James. Once they've both given their talks, I will return to the screen and we'll move to the Q&A session. You can submit questions at any point during the event and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Benedict Holbling from University College London. Hi, Benedict. Hi, thank you so much, Josie, for the introduction. Um, I will just share my slides. So yeah, as Josie said, uh, my name is Benedict and I'm a PhD student at University College London at the UK Dementia Research Institute. My research interest is investigating the cellular and molecular mechanisms um, behind what's causing frontotemporal dementia and I do that by using stem cells. But let's start in the very beginning and get everyone on the same page. So when we talk about dementia, we use this as an umbrella term to describe different conditions which are causing changes and damage to the brain. And there are different um, diseases which are summarized by this term, such as Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, vascular dementia, or today's focus, uh, frontotemporal dementia. And frontotemporal dementia itself is a relatively rare disease, um, just making up less than one in 20 cases of all uh, dementia cases. However, in the age group below 65, it is the second most common form of dementia. And today, around 16,000 people in the UK live with this disease. But what exactly is frontotemporal dementia? Frontotemporal dementia, or short FTD, is characterized by a loss of brain cells in the frontal and temporal lobes. And these are two different areas of the brain carrying out different functions. The frontal lobe, um, which sits in the front of um, the skull is uh, where basically the personality sits and where social behavior is um, saved. And it is also um, one of its tasks to solve problems and many other things. The temporal lobe, the green one here on the side, um, is necessary for language comprehension, for hearing, um, to deal with emotions and also many other tasks. And depending on which of these areas is mostly affected, we can differentiate different subtypes of frontotemporal dementia. This includes uh, behavioral FTD, mostly affecting the frontal lobe, but also um, subtypes affecting the temporal lobe, mostly um, such as semantic dementia or progressive non-fluent aphasia. So two people both being diagnosed with FTD might have very different symptoms. And the reason for that is that um, FTD is a disease spectrum. And the other disease on the spectrum I would like to quickly talk about today is called motor neuron disease. You might have heard of this before, and motor neuron disease is also a, um, a disease in which we use, uh, lose nerve cells, but those are nerve cells controlling our muscle movement. And um, it is also known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And many people know these diseases, uh, for example, from the Facebook Ice Bucket Challenge, which was created to uh, create awareness of the, these diseases, um, or also from famous people being affected by mountain neuron disease, such as Stephen Hawking or uh, the American baseball player Lou Gehring. And now these two diseases seem to be very, very different, right? Uh, with a behavioral and um, semantic uh, component on the one side and a loss of muscle control on the other side. But the truth is that they both um, belong to the same disease continuum or spectrum. They are not always clearly distinguishable and many patients have been diagnosed with a mixed form of so-called FTD motor neuron disease. 
and also people being diagnosed initially with one of the diseases have a li higher likelihood of developing symptoms of the other. And this becomes even more clear if we look at what causes those diseases, um, which I will talk about in a second. Um, but for the rest of the talk, we will mainly focus just about uh, frontotemporal dementia. So what causes FTD? Um, today, we know that about 30% of all cases are familial. This means there is a familial history to it, and often the cause of the disease has been inherited from parents. However, the majority of cases, around 70%, um, is not familial, so we call it sporadic. This might still be um, mutations in our genes that cause it, um, or those might be environmental risks. And now that I'm starting to talk about um, genes and DNA, just a little recap of what those terms mean. DNA is a molecule in our cells which is storing genetic information that we inherit uh, throughout generations. And RNA downstream of that is basically a similar molecule, but it is a blueprint of those uh, stored information that we use to um, produce proteins in the end. Proteins itself, they are the actual functional molecules in the cell carrying out different tasks. Um, those can be hormones, they can be taste receptors um, that you need. So taken together, the DNA is storing genetic information um, to produce proteins carrying out functions. And a mutation means that there is a change in our DNA um, that can be inherited or it can be spontaneous and just occurring in one person. And this change in the stored information can have a change on the protein function in the end. And what scientists have found over the last couple of decades is that people with frontotemporal dementia oft have, uh, often have uh, mutations in the same subset of genes. So we call those genes risk genes because if they're affected, a person is at risk of developing front temporal dementia. And there are quite a few of them, but today I will focus on one of them, which is called c 9 orf 72 And this is a bit of a complicated name, but all it really describes is its location. So um, it's basically a postcode for its genetic location. And the reason I am interested in this particular gene is um, that a mutation in the gene C9RF72 is the most common cause of frontotemporal dementia. It is making up around 25% of all familiar cases and also um, some of the sporadic cases. And to describe what this mutation does, I would just like to compare um, the stored genetic information in the DNA to a sentence that you can read in a book um, that normally doesn't cause any problems in the cells. However, in people with the c 9 orf 72 mutation, we find that a subset of this stored mutation is repeated over and over and over again, hundreds or thousands of times. And as you might imagine, since um, the DNA is the building plan for proteins, this is causing some severe problems. In fact, uh, this repetitive DNA sequence is creating um, a repetitive and toxic protein. Uh, we call those dipeptide repeat containing proteins or short DPRs. Now there are different DPRs created from this region, but let's pretend it's just one for today. So what happens in the cell? Um, healthy brain cells normally don't make DPRs or toxic proteins. However, in people carrying the c 9 of 72 mutation, those toxic proteins are made, they aggregate and accumulate in the cells and they are uh, what's causing the loss of the brain cells in the end. So the main question of my research is why are they made and how are DPRs made? Because first of all, the cell is basically producing something that's harming itself. So this should not happen. Also, we don't exactly know the mechanism behind it of how they are made. And if we understand the mechanism and the how, we could potentially try to stop the cells from producing them as a um, potential intervention point um, for our therapeutic strategies in the future. So first of all, we would like to understand what is going on in the brain cells of patients. And now obviously we cannot do this directly. So we are taking a little, a little detour. And this is called um, patient-derived stem cells. How does this work? 
um, patients who have been diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia and carrying the C9 mutation um, have kindly donated skin cells um, that we got from a biopsy. And skin cells are not the cell type we are directly interested in. So we are using a method called reprogramming into induced pluripotent stem cells. And stem cells have an amazing capability, which means that we can, uh, they can become anything, any type of the cell uh, of the human body. We could make um, liver cells or lung cells, but in our case, we are interested in brain cells. So the way this works is we are feeding stem cells with certain nutritional factors that um, make them become brain cells. So they are developing into brain cells in a dish in our lab. And this way, we are then able to, try, um, to understand the disease mechanism of frontotemporal dementia and measure the amounts of the um, dipeptide repeats, the toxic proteins, um, while we are doing this. Um, to visualize this a little bit better, I'm going to show you a video. And we are starting at day zero of our protocol um, with, um, oops, sorry. Um, with stem cells here, you can see all of these um, little structures here are stem cells. They are a bit roundish. And as I said, they can become anything. So when this video starts, I started to give them some nutritional factors, which make them become brain cells. And over the course uh, of this video, you will see how they become first more spiky. And in the end, they will become like uh, little cables um, being connected. And let's just start this so yeah the cells become more spiky over time in the first place and they are first progenitors of neurons and after a few days like now you're hopefully already able to see a lot of those cable-like structures and after five days um, those are brain cells that we are growing in a dish so they are connected by these long cables, uh, which are called axons, and they are exchanging um, electrical signals to communicate, which is exactly what's going on in the brain and how our brain works. So we are using those cells now to understand how FTD is working. But how do we do that? Um, the cell is a very, very complex machinery, and there is a lot going on. This is just an image of uh, the interior of a cell, and every dot you can see here is a protein carrying out a specific function. So the cell is basically like clockwork. And if we try to understand how it is working, uh, let's compare it to this. Now, this is a watch with different dials. And if we are interested to find out what makes one of those dials work, uh, we would most certainly take the watch apart, um, open it, and we will find a lot of gears. And we would know that this is what drives um, all of the dials and what makes the clock, uh, the watch ticking, but we don't know what gear is driving which function. So to investigate this, we would remove one gear at a time and try to see what is the effect of removing gear number A on the operation of the watch. There will be many gears that we remove, which will just completely stop the watch from functioning. However, there will be a subset of gears if we remove them um, just one of the dials might stop working. And this is exactly what we are trying to do within the cell. We are removing one gear at a time, which here is um, a certain protein or gene. And um, by doing this multiple times, but always one uh, gear at a time, so to say, we are trying to find out which gene determines how many uh, of those DPRs are made. So um, this is what we have done in a recent study. And I have removed uh, 156 genes or gears from the system, um, one at a time to see how its removal is affecting how the cell as a machine works and how many of those toxic peptides are made. And what I found was that removal of five of those genes did stop the production of DPR specifically. So it stopped uh, within the cell a certain process, just the one that we are interested in. So basically like one dial of this watch with multiples. And this is looks on the graph scientifically, um, just if you're interested. But basically this means we're getting 
stepwise, we are getting closer to understand um, the production of those toxic peptides, why the cells are making it in the patients. And we are slowly starting to get the bigger picture. And in the end, of course, we would be interested to see if we could um, stop those gears or stop this uh, machinery um, in some place to stop the cells from producing things that are toxic and potentially um, to find um, uh, therapies uh, for FTD in the future. Um, now I'm almost at the end. I would like to uh, quickly summarize what I've been talking about today. So frontotemporal dementia is a disease spectrum and it is on the same disease spectrum as motor neuron disease and there are different subtypes of FTD. The most common cause for FTD is the mutation in a gene called c 9 orf 72 and this is leading to the production of toxic proteins, so-called DPRs. Now, understanding or trying to block the DPR production could prevent the loss of brain cells in FTD. And we have recently five, uh, found five new genes which are involved in the DPR production. And this will be now investigated further. With this, I would like to thank everybody who has been involved in the work, um, especially Professor Adrian Isaacs and his lab at um, University College London, and also to Alzheimer's Research UK for funding this work. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I would like to hand over to our next speaker, uh, Professor James Rowe. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Benedict, and, and welcome all. It's a great pleasure to, to talk with you today as part of these Lab Notes series. I'll just take a second to call up my own slides. Do keep those questions coming in in the chat in the Q&A, sorry, um, and uh, I'll, I'll get going. I'm very happy to answer some of those questions uh, in the Q&A in a moment. So I'm going to be talking more generally around how uh, biomedical research takes place uh, in general, uh, typically with a pathway illustrated here from left to right, from understanding genetics through to some of the biology and sort of biochemistry uh, of, of how tissues work through stem cells and into animal models developing uh, these models of disease to try and develop new treatments and eventually bring those forward to benefit patients and, and their families, bringing that finally full circle back to understanding the genetics. And this is a way that uh, many uh, studies and many diseases uh, take place, but there is a fundamental problem and a blockage here at the transition into human, uh, the human condition. And there's something special about people. Uh, it's partly that our lives are lived over 80 years, not 80 days or weeks. We have very much more complex genetics than um, the, the many animal models. And we do things that are good for our brains through education, building up cognitive reserve and resilience that can help uh, protect ourselves from, from some of these disease processes. But as people, we also do things that are perhaps not so good. We drink alcohol, don't take enough exercise, we may smoke or have a poor diet. Um, so these are also things that are very particular to, to how humans live their lives. But there's also like, an even more fundamental block, which is around the nature of the illness, how it affects us as people, our autobiographical and personal autobiography, our personal memories, our language, our personality, and who we are as people in the social context of families and our community. And none of this can be uh, adequately captured uh, except by studying people. And this change in language and personality in our social roles is very much at the heart of frontotemporal dementias. As Benedict touched on, this is a group of illnesses really that can affect behavior and language. Those of you living with frontotemporal dementia in the family might have already had the name progressive aphasia or primary progressive aphasia. That's the language variants of frontotemporal dementia. It can affect semantics or understanding and fluency, articulation and grammar either on its own or with changes in behavior. And those behavioral changes can come with Parkinson's disease-like symptoms, not Parkinson's disease, but symptoms a little bit like, or indeed motor neuron disease as muscle wasting. This, these problems can occur alone or in combination, and it means that no two patients are alike and none really behave or feel or look like those animals uh, with FTD genes. And that creates a challenge, one of several challenges we'll, we'll touch on in the next few minutes. We think about what causes frontotemporal dementia. Well, the short answer is there are many causes, but I might separate in my mind causes that are really the root cause 
uh, particularly thinking around genetics. And as Benedict's touched on, we know quite a bit already around the role of genetics in, in some kind, forms of frontotemporal temporal dementia. But we also know a lot more about what's causing the disease to progress, what's driving the disease once it's begun, this buildup of junk proteins, um, uh, the process of inflammation that seems to be set in motion with FTD, the way this causes brain cells to stress and ultimately fail, to die back and to cause a, a loss in the network, uh, these connections in the brain. But these are many different causes, each which might invite different ways of, of treating. And the third challenge is there are many faces, even of genetic FTD, you could take a single gene, such as the C9 or 72 gene um, that, that Benedict's focused on. So one gene that actually has several pathologies. And he's introduced us to these uh, little bits of, of, of junk protein, little bits of protein called dipeptide or peach DPRs. There's also a buildup of a much larger sort of claggy uh, protein called uh, TDP43, and there's inflammation. So there's several parts to the story, even following one gene mutation. The real challenge is this creates an explosion of different symptoms and signs, perhaps with Parkinsonism and movement problems, balance coordination, changes in behavior, particularly in behavioral variant, FTD, alterations of language and muscle wasting, or any combination of the above. So even with something as straightforward as a single gene, you can get any combination of these, these symptoms and, and, and uh, problems. And that creates a real challenge for designing clinical trials or targeting treatments, because how would I know if it's working? Would I measure the changes in movement and balance and behavior? Well, that's great, except what if the particular patient I'm treating was going to go on to get problems in language or problems in muscle wasting? So how am I going to know if a drug's uh, even working? There's some good news though, and that is we do know that the basic biology, the underlying biology in people is very similar to what's happening in those stem cells and the mice with uh, the genetic changes that could be introduced. Some really nice evidence for this comes really uh, by astute colleagues, so working Bill Seeley, who studied a patient who'd fallen from a horse. And that led to very severe epilepsy early in life and that epilepsy got worse and worse. And ultimately the only way to treat that epilepsy was to take out that trigger zone which happens to be in the temporal lobe. This is a scan, a brain scan, showing the main bulk of the brain. And here on one side, in the temporal lobe, there's a hole where the surgeons took some tissue out. But many years later, this lady got frontotemporal dementia and turned out to have the C9 North 72 gene mutation. So they were able to go back to look at this tissue that was taken out. And they saw scattered throughout, there's lots and lots of cells. Each dot here is a position of a cell in which they found these dipeptide repeats, these little bits of junk protein or mini proteins, we have not even full proteins that have come from this c 72 And this was present throughout much of this bit of the brain, but without the damage to the brain cells, there wasn't degeneration, it wasn't dying back of the brain yet, but it showed that in, in this person, in people generally perhaps, this biological change can begin and is building up throughout life before the symptoms begin. And indeed, now, as of uh, uh, this, this year, um, colleagues in the UK have led on to the ability to measure uh, in, in fluids that can be taken from, from patients in blood or, or spinal fluid to measure these dipeptides repeats. And now we know what we're chasing. We know it's the same biological process uh, as Benedict was studying in his stem cells. Uh, and then later on, we were studying in, in, in mice models to develop new drugs. So just to recap some of the problems, well, FTD is a complex human disorder, but the solution is to have better studies of the human brain and human behavior. We've seen there are many causes, genetic and non-genetic causes, and the solution will be to be able to measure each of those processes and to test them each as a potential target for treatments, either alone or in combination. And we've seen how each gene causes many types of illness. It is a very complex problem. And yet it can be a rare disease, although FTD is relatively common as a whole, by the time you narrow down onto each gene or gene type in each syndrome, uh, it, it can become quite rare. So the solution is to have better coordination and collaboration and be planning for better, more effective clinical trials. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. And it's really transformed globally through new collaborations. Uh, it's a really a very exciting field to be a researcher in, to be a doctor in because of the sense of collaboration and the palpable sense that uh, there are new treatments uh, within reach, within sight um, through these collaborations. And I'll just touch on some of those for a moment. Many of them are led here from the UK. 
Um, uh, one is called the Frontal Temporal Prevention Initiative, and this has brought together colleagues who in many different uh, centres and organisations across Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, and soon we hope also India, Korea, China and Japan, bringing together under a common framework the way to study and understand and to treat frontal temporal dementias. This co uh, collaboration and coordination gives you a lot of power to study the changes on a large scale and to see what's representative, what's typical, while also thinking about what's individual to a patient's unique experience. So I'm going to show you some data. I'll just talk you through this sort of science slide for a moment. This, the, each of these lines comes from many thousands of, uh, of individual measurements with brain scans and many hundreds of participants. We're looking at people's uh, brain changes over years. Year zero is the time when symptoms uh, come on. So we can either look after year zero or before year zero. And the sort of the up and down uh, height here is around the amount of brain tissue in each part of the brain. So if we were to look at somebody five or 10 years after symptoms come on in the hospital setting, a typical hospital scanner, we can see the back of the brain here looking very healthy, the folds of the brain filling the space very well. But at the front of the brain, we can see the severe shrinkage. It's the frontal part of frontotemporal dementia. This bit of the brain, so important for personality, thinking and behavior, has really been severely shrunken down and, and damaged. But actually now with so uh, even ordinary MRI with some special analytical techniques, we can see subtler changes 10 or 12 years before symptoms. So coming on the left of the onset line, we can see changes here, particularly in, in the frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, and indeed, we, this gives us a chance to measure the rate of change of illness, even while the people here on the left-hand side of this graph, they're well. They may be carrying genes, but they do not have any symptoms yet. We'd like to be able to show that a treatment shallowed that line out, showed protection, preservation of brain tissue as we're well, preserving, indeed preventing uh, frontal temporal dementia, even from starting. Now there's something special about those people who are carrying the CNA North 72 gene expansion that, that Benedict was talking about. The members of this study who are in their early twenties, already they had differences in their brain from healthy people. Now we're not saying that's degeneration or the dementia starting, it might even be an aspect of this gene related to the development through our childhood, but clearly there were differences very, very early in life. We can use different forms of brain scanning to pick up those other causes, it may not be the root cause, but the sort of contributory causes along the way. We can see with MRI that in patients in the top row, there's severe shrinkage, particularly at the front and the sides, the front of temporal parts of the brain. But even 10, 15 years before in healthy carriers of the genes, we see some areas of severe atrophy, actually beginning in this deep relay station here called the thalamus deep in the brain. That's interesting for us because we use different types of scanners to look at those loss of those connections, those little threads or cables that Benedict was talking about between his stem cells uh, that become neurons. They connect with the special connections that we can measure now with a specialist scan. And in patients, we see a widespread loss, particularly at the front of the brain. But if we looked in people carrying the gene, even five or 10, 20 years before symptoms, we see this thalamus, this deep relay station, being a hotspot for the very early loss of connections. And we can also use different type of scanners to pick up inflammation, particularly here in the frontal and temporal parts of the brain. So we can now measure these processes and know whether treatments targeting those problems are, are likely to be effective. Now, brain scans are, are expensive and time consuming and not very portable. So there's a lot of effort to say, how can we capture what's happening with something that's easily scalable, portable, cheaper uh, to easier? You know, what about a blood test? And again, through these international collaborations, we can now, uh, for the research and possibly soon also in clinical care, look at some of the chemicals in the blood that are telltale signs of frontal temporal dementia. So I'm showing a graph here looking at the years during a study, people being followed up for up to five years, and we're measuring the amount of the chemicals. The height here is the amount of this chemical per neurofilament. And each of these lines is data for many, many thousands of blood tests. And in either people who've got normal genes or people who are carrying the, a, a faulty gene but are still healthy, this neurofilament is dead flat year on year. In red is showing the level in patients who've already got symptoms, okay, and the level's high and it stays high, year on year it stays high. What's special is to say those who are gene carriers, so they're carrying a faulty gene and they're coming up for the onset of their symptoms, 
And they selected out those who do what we call converting from FT to FTD. In other words, they were healthy at the start of the study, but during those three or four years developed symptoms, the onset of their illness. And here we can see this rising blood level, again, in something as simple and straightforward as a blood test. And that's really very important to en en enable and empower clinical uh, trials uh, and to know where the treatments are uh, beginning to work. But it's not all in the blood. You know, people have you know, rich and complex uh, ways of thinking and behaving that, that matter more than, than a blood test, perhaps. And we can also uh, look at the impact of the way the brain is working for the brain function. How, for example, the relationship between apathy, very much part of the FDD symptomatology, and other forms of cognition, memory, thinking, behavior, how are they related? Well, in those of us with, with normal genes, the answer is they're not really related very well. You can be either highly motivated or a bit more chilled out and, and, and think just as well. But these studies with these large collaborations have shown that if you're carrying the genes for FTD, even when you're healthy, actually the degree of motivation or rather the degree of apathy has a knock on effect on your cognitive ability, how well you're able to think and be flexible in your thinking. So this relationship between the brain function and your genes begins very early on. And we can also think about the general health of the brain. Now we know there's, there's bad genes, I'm going to call these the FDD genes, the C9 or 72 is one of those genes that cause poor brain health and eventually may bring on the dementia. But there are also early signs that are protective genes. And through these collaborations through a study called Genetic uh, FDD Initiative here based at UCL and, and other sites in the UK and, and then internationally, some protective genes that you might inherit alongside the bad genes. These actually protect your brain health. But something very special was observed. It did so more in those with high levels of education. So there were good genes as well as bad genes. And sometimes we need to help those good genes you know, to, to, do their, to do their magic, to do their beneficial effects. So education, things we can do something about can work with our good genes to offset the bad genes and try and protect brain health and delay the onset of the illness. Now, there are other things we might want to do, uh, perhaps much more radical treatments to switch off uh, the, the illness. And for those people who are carrying genes that are like the C9072 gene that causing frontal temporal dementia, we're already in an era of clinical trials. Now, these are not licensed treatments. They don't even know if they work, but they're being tested now in people with frontal temporal dementia. One of them ongoing in the UK uses little designer RNA fragments. So RNA is a bit like DNA. It's our bodies convert DNA into RNA temporarily, and that then goes on to, to help the cells work in the brain. So these little designer RNA fragments prevent the, that, uh, the mutation being converted into these harmful dipeptide repeats. There's another way uh, you can try and keep the harmful DNA, this repeat word that Benedict talked about, keep that wrapped up. Uh, and, and, and stop it from being transformed into protein, stop it triggering that inflammation and cell death. And there are many other ways that are coming to trials in humans, trying to really with some very cutting edge technologies about building little mini RNA segments that work a bit like an antibody to, to neutralize the harmful RNA. In fact, there are also some designer monoclonal antibodies, true antibodies that are designed to, to latch onto and to neutralize these harmful proteins to stop them spreading in the brain. So it's a very exciting, very fast moving field. So we need to think about what's, what's a roadmap? How are we going to actually bring this to, to the benefit of, of uh, you know, families and people affected now or in the future by FDD? Many of you, um, you know, um, may be in this situation. I think the first place I'd start is to say it really starts with best NHS care. There's a lot one can do now to get an accurate diagnosis as the starting point and to have access to the discussions around genetics whether a genetic test would be helpful, what, what type of FTD, frontal temporal dementia might it be, and could it be the start of some of these more genetically targeted um, frontal temporal dementias, which, as I said, are now in experimental medicine clinical trials, but are really pointing the way towards what I'd call personalized medicine, giving a treatment that's based on your unique genetics. If it works with patients who have symptoms, the way that we're moving as a community is to then think about giving it to people who carry those same harmful genes, but treating years before when people are fully healthy. And that amounts to prevention. So this, there's a pathway to a, a strategy for thinking about prevention of those genetic FTDs.
all the while we mustn't forget symptoms people you know are living with the difficulty of living with ftd here and now there's some symptoms that are, are right for treatment trials and more research is needed about uh, reducing those treatment uh, those symptoms and although i've talked a lot about the genetic ftd actually the majority of frontotemporal temporal dementia is not genetic and you know, we need to think about strategies that might be able to slow or halt all of those with FTD, whether or not it's genetics. So we're beginning as a research community to put in, in place the bricks of, in the building blocks around the genetic causes, trying to understand the biology in humans, how does it relate to the biology in stem cells and animals, getting better at picking up those psychological aspects of the illness, working globally, thinking about brain health, not just with the illness, but even years before the illness, and how we might measure that with scans or blood or memory tests and the like each of which is trying to tackle, identify uh, and, 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 and treat those many different causes of FTD, which an optimist would say actually gives you many different targets. That's already led to clinical trials. And you know, in my, my sort of future career, a few years left in my career, I'm really hoping there'll be enough progress that we can be talking not just around treating and reacting to FTD, but really thinking around prevention. And I'd like to really share and end this talk uh, on a message of hope that the way that universities and hospitals and industry and research communities are working together has really changed in the last five or 10 years. It's a much smarter way of thinking about who and when we might treat, what types of drugs or vaccines are coming into clinical trials, thinking around the early stages of illness with an eye to prevention as well as treatment. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you to the fantastic team I'm able to work with here in Cambridge, but also colleagues at UCL and around the world. And I'd like to hand back to Josie uh, to help manage the questions and answers. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, James. Um, I'd like to invite Benedict back to join us for the Q&A as well. And thank you both for such fascinating talks. It was really, really interesting to see how sort of Benedict's research starts looking at those stem cells and that molecular level of FTD. And then James really bring it all together and hear all about those amazing collaborations. It's really, really fascinating. Thank you both so much. Um, I think we'll start off with a question for Benedict first. Um, so, um, uh, Karen asked while you were giving your talk, Benedict, how do you know no. when to stop removing genes that may have had an impact on DPR production? So when, yeah, how, how did you know when, when you needed to remove those or when to stop? Um, so we are removing, always just removing one gene. We are not removing many genes from the same population of cells. We always have one population in which one of those genes is missing. So, um, there is no point where we have to stop removing genes, but we are also assessing how healthy the cells are, um, which means if we are removing a cell which is impacting the health, uh, sorry, if we remove a gene which uh, has a negative impact then on the cell's health, um, un unrelated to the DPRs, for example, we would notice this and this is excluded from our study then. Okay, great, thank you. Um, perhaps one for James next. So I think you might have briefly touched on this, but um, if you could just uh, answer it again, a question from Jeanette who says, when a patient is diagnosed with FTD, do healthcare professionals know at the time of diagnosis if they have familial or non-familial uh, frontotemporal dementia? Yeah, no, this, this is a really important issue. I think several, several questions touch on the importance of getting a good diagnosis at a certain diagnosis with people who know and you know, have experience in FTD. It is complex, there are alternatives. Um, and is it familial? I suppose we would look to the story that the family is telling us, a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, a cousin, um, having the illness. It's a little more complex because they might not have had frontotemporal dementia by name. There might be an illness that could be part of a pattern, a genetic pattern, but it might have gone by another name. It might have just been a, a psychotic or depressive episode late in life. It might have been motor neuron disease, and it's relatively recent that people have realized the connection of that to frontal temporal dementia. They seem very different on the surface, but they are connected. Uh, even Parkinson's disease, there are versions of Parkinson's-like illnesses that can be part of the FTD story. So you want to have somebody who can, you can explore the family history but with knowledge about what to be looking for. And that will give a clue, is it familial? Behind that is, is it genetic? Um, and 
about in half of the families where it looks to us that there's a family tree suggesting inheritance, in only about half of those at the moment do we know what those genes would be. So perhaps I give the figures out of 10 people coming forward with a diagnosis of FDD, probably four out of 10 will be telling us there's information in the family tree to suggest it's familial, but only two out of the 10 would we with a genetic test be able to find the exact gene. So there's a lot more work to be done. And that's for genes which a single gene is on its own enough to cause the illness. There was the more complicated story behind genes that there may be some, some uh, combinations of genes, unique shuffling that we each get that might make one person at risk of genes, a risk of the illness when neither parent had it and maybe their children won't get it because of the reshuffling of genes every time. So combinations of genes make for a very complicated story. But at the moment, we, we look for the uh, singular genes that are on their own enough to cause the illness. Great. Thank you, James. Um, I might come back to Benedict, actually. This was probably a really good follow on from the question I asked you before, um, but we'll come back to it now. Uh, so those five genes that, you that you've discovered, um, do you know what they do within cells? So do you know yet how they affect um, the cells and how they work in different ways? Or, or is that still something to find out? Um, we know what they do normally in the cells. So what we are looking at uh, with the DPRs is basically a side effect that we discovered. Uh, they normally have a, um, all of those genes that we were interested in. Um, they have a function of making the DNA accessible to be read, basically. Um, and this is one large family of proteins that we were interested in because we thought um, this genetic information is so repetitive, so it might be difficult to be read, uh, to be read. And this is why we removed those genes which are um, involved in this process. Um, so we know that those five genes definitely do that. They make the genetic code more accessible and readable. Um, but we have, yeah. Um, some of them are involved in different diseases. We know that two of those five genes are also involved in cancer formation, for example. And this will now be really interesting to see if um, there could be some common mechanism behind those or um, with where these genes, uh, what they are interacting with, and if we could find another uh, connection to other genes possibly. Great, thank you. So interesting that stuff about genetics and genes as, as you were saying James how it all links together and it could be different for every person as well um, I think another one um, back to James for you I'm going to just combine a couple of questions here one from Richard and one from Jeanette who are sort of both asking is there anything that we can do or any sort of lifestyle choices that we can make to help potentially um, delay or prevent um, onset of FTD and maybe other dementias as well yes so there's some the, the knowing that when we're carrying a gene, I think would really sharpen the focus on saying, what, what can I now do in my life to reduce the chance or to delay the onset? And this goes beyond the kind of normal health advice that doctors are always giving patients, you know, take more exercise, drink less. But when you're carrying a gene, it really sharpens the focus. And I think there are some things to think about. So one is to really minimize other health conditions as far as is possible. And for many people that will come down to keeping generally fitter, drinking less alcohol uh, very much. So not smoking, smoking is extremely bad for, for the brain uh, and, and for the heart and the heart brain relationship. Um, and being socially uh, and, and, and sort of mentally active either through work or through early retirement years. So keeping stimulated and being generally healthy, but it really sharpens the focus on, on that advice that you, know, you really must do what one can. There are also some other things you can do if you think you may be getting or at risk of getting FTD, it's not always clear when the start is. And there may be some choices either in, uh, in lifestyle choices or, or through professional you know, work choices that you would minimize the risk to say, well, if I were to start to get it, um, what could I be doing where it wouldn't cause harm if I was a bit late to realize it myself? So, you know, um, you know, without being too flippant, you know, being an air traffic controller or an air pilot, you know, airline pilot, it's not a great job if you're at risk of getting FTD because the risks and consequences might be high that by the time you know it might be symptom might be coming, it's 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 an accident might already have happened. There may be many other jobs where it's much more leeway, much more tolerance, giving you and your family and colleagues time to, to catch up with the possible start of an illness. 
Um, the other thing I'd say though is if, if you're worried about it, come forward, talk to the team that you or your family are connected to for FDD, talk about your concerns. And probably when we follow people in our clinic who carry genes, one of the most important things is to come forward if you have other worries, because very often, if you experience difficulty, concentration difficulty, agitation, um, distress, actually it's got other factors in life. One can be distressed or depressed or anxious for any of the other reasons that other people get, and that can be treated and put one's mind at rest to say, you know, this isn't the FDD, you're still okay. So keep in contact with your doctor and coming forward, I think it's probably most important on top of those general health measures around exercise, diet, alcohol, smoking. Great, thank you. Um, uh, um, we have our Think Brain Health campaign um, that we like to talk about. And so if anyone has any more questions about brain health or um, those sort of lifestyle choices that you can make, you can have a look over on our website, um, the Alzheimer's Research UK Think Brain Health. There's some questions about that. Um, James, I might stick with you um, for a question about what are the symptoms of FTD and what are the differences with the likes of vascular dementia? And maybe perhaps we could touch on an, another few um, other causes of dementia as well, maybe Alzheimer's too. Yes. So although I've emphasized how variable frontotemporal dementias can be and no two patients are alike, they all do have something in common and they are as well different from other forms of dementia. So um, whilst memory can be part of FTD, it tends to be milder and later. Whereas, for example, in the more common Alzheimer's disease, memory problems are dominant and they're early. They're the main early symptom. So that's an immediate way when we sort of start to tell the difference between frontotemporal dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease can affect language, but it does so in a particular way that's not like the FTD language disorders. That's probably a bit difficult to explain in, in, in 30 seconds to a, to a wide audience, but it's something that a, a neurologist or a psychiatrist interested in FDD could, could spot in an instant uh, and to help you know, as part of getting the right diagnosis. Vascular dementia is a little bit trickier. Um, if the vascular disease happens to fall in the frontal and temporal parts of the brain, it will mimic frontal temporal dementia in some ways. Um, and it can often give rise to apathy and slowness and withdrawal. But generally, vascular dementia looks quite different. It lacks some of what I might call the more distinctive features, um, either in the language variant, there's very particular forms of language impact that um, FTD causes, it sounds different to, to, to vascular dementia. Um, and certainly the behaviors from the behavioral variant tend to be different. They tend to be a bit more, um, uh, you know, more obvious change of personality, often a bit more extrovert, a bit more challenging, um, a bit more predictable, rather than the, than the withdrawal or irritability that can come with vascular dementia. So there are symptoms. Um, it's actually much more important through the story, the symptoms, and the, the conversation with the neurologist than it is on the MRI scan. The MRI or CT scans have a part to play but they're never what should be making the diagnosis. They can confirm a diagnosis. Um, but it's really, yes, in, to, to, to a neurologist, they're really, they're really are quite different patterns of symptoms. You know, when we hear a very different story between the different dementias. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much, James. Um, I'm gonna come to Benedict next for another question. So um, David asks, will stem cell research allow you to identify protective genes as well as FTD ones? And I might tag a little question on the end here of like, where, where else can stem cell research help us in, in sort of FTD research, like where's the next step for it? Um, yeah, there are some preventive genes which are helping to shift the, late, uh, the age of onset, for example, um, a little bit to the back. Also, we know that for other dementias um, that they're helping to clear those um, junk proteins sometimes. Um, so that we know, and also we might be able, if we find more of those protective genes and proteins, we um, would try to enhance their function to help even more to prevent uh, this disease or at least to um, delay um, the onset of it. And um, your question was how else the stem cells could be used. Um, so I think there are some therapeutic strategies to use them in patients, at least for Parkinson's disease. Um, so that basically brain cells that are grown in a dish could replace the ones that have been lost during the disease but this is still quite early um, since um, brain cells are basically like 
um, electric wiring, um, it's hard to control where they go and uh, to make them form the proper connections and uh, fight the right target, basically. Um, I don't know, um, maybe James knows more if there are any trials for frontotemporal dementia. I just know about the ones in Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah so there's, there's quite a lot of trials ongoing for those with genetic frontotemporal dementia in, in terms of treatments to try and stop that fundamental biology, slow and stop the illness in its tracks. Um, there are trials, um, if, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, and you can look, that's a website, clinicaltrials.gov, you can look up trials that are ongoing for any disease, and you, that would include frontotemporal dementia. Some of those are trials looking at symptoms, trying to reduce the intensity of symptoms rather than switch the illness off altogether. Uh, there are not many trials at the moment for non-genetic FTD, uh, but those will come. I think it seems more in, in more tractable, closer in reach for the genetic forms of FTD at the moment. Thanks, James. Um, uh, we also have our Joint Dementia Research Service, which um, we support at Alzheimer's Research UK. So that's a website where you can, if you were interested in taking part in trials yourself, you can sign up online um, and they can match. It's a bit of a matching service, so they can link you up with um, with trials that are ongoing. Um, well, I'll show us. I'll share a slide at the end of the talk with some more information about that. Um, James, if it's all right to come back to you, or have you got some dogs in your house? Uh, yes, I'm afraid you just said a dog has just arrived in my house. I do apologise. I'll try to keep it quiet. That's okay. Um, we've had a, a really interesting question from Siobhan and Theo, um, who I'm going to just read it out. So they say, if a loved one was tested for genetic FTD around three years ago, but was only checked for GRN, MAT-T and c 9 or 72 so these are different... Um, genes that we know are associated with FTD for everyone else. Um, it's possible, is it possible or worthwhile for them to get tested again with respect to these new genes that we have been identified? Uh, so I was a short answer, I says probably yes. And that's a discussion to have with the team who arranged that initial testing. Uh, and usually the new tests can be run on the old samples. Um, it's just a question of being clear about what is one testing for. And the technology for testing has changed greatly in the last five years. One used to have to test gene by gene, and it was quite expensive for each and every gene. Um, now, the te for technological reasons, we, we now test for a whole panel, 25, 30 genes, and it's one price for all of them together. Uh, and you can keep going back, looking again and again when new gene discoveries are made, when new information comes to light. So I say, if it's still very much of concern, go back and talk to the, the doctors with, who arranged that original testing. Thank you. Um, I, uh, we've only probably really got time for one more question each. So um, I'll come to Benedict first. Um, we've been hearing a lot um, and over those last few questions about um, how much progress has been made in the last five years um, in terms of diagnosis and research in general. So Benedict, what are your biggest hopes for the future for the next five years or the next 10 years of dementia research? I guess my hope would be that um, something that uh, James mentioned would become uh, more accessible, which is personalized medicine, so that every person gets the proper treatment, which is um, yeah, specialized for them, depending on um, the genetic mutations they have or whatever their need is really, um, because I think that's still very much lacking today. Um, so that would be my biggest hope. Thank you. And James, the same question. Yes, I would dearly love that just to start with one of the current treatments in a clinical trial is shown to be effective. That'd be an absolute game changer. Even if that's just for one you know, small subgroup of a genetic form of FTD, it would completely change the field because where you can solve one, you can solve the others. We, you know, you'd know that. And it would also mean that NHS services would have to be really geared up to help people with FTD of, of every type. Um, not least to get to, you know, to identify that group which needs the, the proven treatment. But once you reorganize services, all of care gets better. And then treating, curing the other forms of FTD will become so much easier for everybody. Amazing. So Thank we, you. We both start with so one. Much. Yeah, yeah we you. start. Yeah, start with one. Thank you both so much. Um, so just as we approach 1 p.m. nearly. Um, I'd just like to thank you both so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Really, really interesting talks and really great Q&A as well. So we'll say goodbye to you both. Thank Bye, you Ben. Very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you for inviting us. Bye. Thank you. And just before everybody else leaves the call, we've got a couple of poll questions that we'd really like you to answer just to give us a little quick insight into how you found today. So 
hopefully you should be able to see those on your screen now um, just before you leave if you could answer those so was the content of today's talks did you find it too technical about right or too simple um, would you recommend our lab notes events to your family and friends and finally um, my favorite one have you learned something new about dementia research it could just be one one small thing have you learned something new i've definitely learned so much today um, yeah it's been really great so we'll just pause while we get those answers in and those should be on your screen now so really great to see that um, you all found it just about right and you would recommend these events and that most people have learned something new really really pleased to see that so um, just before you go as well we'll be uh, sending over a more detailed feedback survey to you soon and the video recording will likely be about next week we'll be we'll get that ready so do complete the surveys we appreciate any feedback you can give to see about the event and look out for an email with the um, uh, recording available too and then hopefully we've got a couple more slides to show you uh, about our next event coming up so this will be uh, at sometime in june early june we're hoping uh, however our date is just to be confirmed at the moment and this will be looking at early detection and specifically our eden initiative so our early detection of neurodegenerative diseases um, so keep an eye on our website to find out more information about this and I know today that there were some questions that we weren't able to answer in the time that we had, and also some where you might need some more personalized guidance or information. So our dementia research info line is there to help. They can answer questions and also signpost to other sources of information and support. So please do get in touch with them. Um, they can also give you some information about our joint dementia research service too. And then we've got another slide, hopefully. Um, we are also holding a Q&A on our Instagram stories this week, uh, where we're talking more about frontal temporal dementia. So if you have any more questions, hope, hop over to our Instagram to ask those. And then that's it from me. So I'd just like to say a huge, huge thank you for joining us today. I hope you found it really interesting and useful. And we hope to see you again soon for our next talk. <laughs>